Welcome back to Change Now. This session is connecting, uh, breaking barriers and connecting the dots. I'm your host for this session. My name's Lavelle de Vincenzi, and we're going to be looking at um, the invisible barriers that we really need to overcome in order to be able to create a much more connected society. I'll be putting a spotlight on change makers and organizations who are working with building a more inclusive world. So to kick off this discussion, it wouldn't be right to do this without the strategic advisor to the board of Cartier Philanthropic, Pascal Dillet Frenagy. Hello and welcome. Hello, Pascal. Firstly, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lavelle. Do you know what? It's wonderful to have people actually here live in the studio with us. I know we're in this digital world, but it's nice to, it's nice to have people here. So tell me a little bit first about Cartier Philanthropy. Philanthropy. I can't say that word today. You know I'll, what I mean. I'll say it for you. <laughs> Cartier Philanthropy. Yes. So it all started in uh, 2012 when uh, Cartier decided to start its own philanthropic foundation. And the vision we had at the time was really to help uh, allow everyone to realize their own potential. And as Amartya Sen actually said about, about poverty, when you want to deal with poverty issues, it's not about wealth only. It's about really allowing people to have the capacity to, uh, and the opportunities to reach their potential. So from that vision that we had, we really translated it into uh, the mission that we have at the foundation, which is to improve the lives of the most vulnerable women, children and men who live in some of the poorest countries around the world. So to actually do that and break some of the barriers, visible and invisible, that you were talking about, we're really focusing on four important issues. And the first one being providing access to some essential services that we tend to take for granted education, primary health, nutrition, water and sanitation. Uh, we also want to foster gender equity, which is incredibly important. And to do that, we really empower women so that they can gain access to, um, to skills, to resources, to knowledge, so that they can not only make a living, but also regain dignity and self-confidence. Third area that we focus on is about um, sustainable livelihoods. We're trying to work with some of the poorest people who live in rural areas and give them the, uh, what they need, the services that they need so that they can make a better living while using their resources, their natural resources more responsibly. And then the last area that um, is also very critical is about responding to humanitarian emergencies. And when we do that, we feel that we do it because we feel we can save lives or mitigate the impact of major crises around the world. And to, 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 to link that up with um, those barriers that you're talking about, we very much look at how we can um, help a human capital and promote human capital. Again, skills, knowledge, education, all this, all this uh, very critical um, areas, um, uh, self-confidence, agency. But we also need to look at the physical capital in terms of productive assets that people may need, access to land or uh, livestock, for example. Another critical capital that we look at is the social capital. How do you break isolation when people are very much marginalized? Or um, in the same vein, we look at uh, also the financial capital. Uh, that, that people need to have access to. And, and I think you'll be talking later with, with other guests about access to uh, credit and, and uh, savings mechanisms that are absolutely essential. I, I mean, it's an incredible initiative with a really broad reaching uh, remit in terms of what you're looking to achieve and, and the support that you're looking to give to people. So how do you select the initiatives and the charities to fund? I mean, there are so many awesome opportunities out there. How do you pick? Well, that's, that's the hard part of our work. And it's so important that we do it right. Um, what, what I think we've understood very early on is that our work is more about how we fund than how much we give. So once you look at that, and uh, we've decided we needed to focus on social impact. So what we're tr really trying to do is look at ways we can bring positive change in the lives of people we're trying to serve. 
So for us, um, in order to, to do that, we're going to look at organizations that can demonstrate that their solutions work and are cost effective. And to do that, they need, they need to be very much driven by impact and be able to measure it, which is a critical part. Uh, also, what we expect from the, the, the grantees and the, the organizations that we might consider is um, whether you have the ambition to replicate and take that solution to scale so that it can benefit the largest number of people. So if all that goes really well, we fund long term. Some of our partners we've been funding since the first year of our operations and we still support them today because they're doing a magnificent work. I love what you said there is it's less about how much you fund and more about the impact that you have with that funding. And it kind of brings me really nicely onto my next question, which is I know uh, that you have a very specific sort of data-driven approach that you take and it, you're very outcome oriented in your approach. Can you tell us a little bit different about why, a little, few reasons about why you've taken this approach and is it the role of the funders or the role of the charities to be... <laughs> It kind of feels a little bit the other way around. Like, you know, the funder is saying, we want to see the data. So why have you taken that approach? Yeah, that's a very interesting point you're making. Um, different ways to respond to that. The first one uh, is to say that data will allow you to learn and to understand whether what you're funding is having the uh, desired outcome. With that data, how will you know? People will tell you, but it's how can you base yourself on what people are saying if they want to say something just to please you and not based on... on, on so you want the facts. So we want the facts, exactly, and I think it's, it's important. And um, it is, of course, the responsibility of the, of the nonprofit, of the NGO that is doing the work. At the same time, I feel we funders, because we have the money we have a lot of power too. So we need to be more responsible and more accountable in the way we fund. And if you look at the world today, there's so much urgency to solve very complex poverty issues and there's no time to waste. I mean, the World Bank just announced a few months ago that the pandemic would throw an additional 115 million people into poverty. So we can't just sit there and fund stuff that is not actually having a strong impact. So if you take... Um, for example, imagine that you wanted to improve kids' learning. Mm -hmm. There's different ways you can look at what's preventing kids from learning, different type of barriers. Uh, it can be uh, access to education because the school is too distant, because the family situation requires the kids to work, or because of traditions that will impose that girls will get married too early. But you may want to address other areas more typically focused on learning. Is there a teacher in the school? Is the teacher trained? Is the classroom overcrowded? Uh, there's all these aspects that you may want to look into. So whatever you decide to do, what I think is really critical as a funder to understand so that you can really work in partnership with the organization that you fund is that um, you need to have a very clear assessment of whether what you want to do is actually responding to the needs that you have identified. And once you do that, you really need to embed those uh, data collection all along the, the, your, your program for the design phase, all along, so that you can monitor what's going on and understand what's happening. Any business would do that without even thinking about it. But in philanthropy, you just fund with your heart and you need to also use your brain. We need to fund with our heads, not just our <laughs> hearts. Not just It's a good cause. Let me send money that way. You made a really interesting point there as you spoke about um, funding education, for example, and Often the number we'll look at is perhaps the number of schools that have been built would be like a really interesting stat or um, perhaps how many people have gone to those schools. But it sounds like you guys are, are scratching the surface. You're going deeper than that. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you look at that end to end approach such that you can measure the impact, which is different from we've opened 20 schools, but like you say, if the schools don't have teachers, <laughs> if, the, you know, if, the, if children aren't going to the schools, if there's not insufficient access, the 20 schools doesn't necessarily have the impact. It has the potential, but not necessarily the impact. So how are you measuring that? Well, I think there's, there's a, 
um, very basic principles that we need to look into, and, and, and a lot of uh, funders do that, so I'm not, I'm not giving lessons to, to anybody here, but I think you want to really understand whether what you're doing is relevant. And that's what I was mentioning about making sure that what you're doing is actually responding to the needs that you've identified. I mean, if you train the teachers, but the problem is the distance from school, I mean, you won't be solving the right problem. You won't be. <laughs> exactly. So the relevance is extremely important. Then the uh, effectiveness of your intervention, whether things are actually happening, whether the, the activity that you've decided to, to, uh, to implement are uh, actually uh, taking place. So you need to, to know all that. You want to look at the efficiency of your intervention, the cost effectiveness. If you train five teachers for two years for $200,000, I'm not sure this is something that uh, will actually provide the result that you would want to have. So also that is, is to be taken into, into consideration. Um, another aspect, of course, is then you can, looking at all these different areas, you need to measure the impact of your intervention. And that is, is, you know, will be critical by identifying the right indicators. And then you would want to see talk about kids learning, whether they actually stay in school, that's the first step. And then you can have, you can measure the retention rate year over year of those kids that you've helped uh, go to school. But you also need to really look at uh, whether they're scoring better at their tests at school in math, in English, in Hindi, whatever it is that they're learning. You want to m measure the progress that it's being made. Otherwise, you're not going to be actually providing any improvement. And then another really critical aspect, which is very difficult, I think, to, to actually uh, make sure it happens, is the sustainability aspect of the work that we want to, to, to support and, and fund. Because we work in countries that can be very fragile from a political, economic, social perspective. Um, and the fact is that it's not because you've been funding something for three years that it's going to stay forever like this with the good results. So it's really critical there that whatever intervention you want to support, that it's actually, um, that communities actually take ownership of what you're trying to do because they see the value of what you're doing, not because you're telling them that it's good for them. That's, that never works. And if you're looking at changing behaviors so that people do something differently for better results, that takes time. This is why when I say we fund for many years is because we understand that you can't do, I'll do this for three years and then I'll move to something else another three years. And, and then what, what happens? So we always try to go back, to try to see what we did two years ago. Is our things still happening? And that we can only do because we work in very close partnership with our, the organizations that we fund. They, they actually do the hard work, yeah. but we want to be as understanding and supportive as we should be to help them succeed. Pascal, I mean, there was so much in what you just shared there. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just unpacking it a little bit for myself in so much as what you're saying is it's not just important to fund. What's important to, is to fund for longevity and to, to fund in such a way that the communities take ownership of it so that they can move those things forward. But there's lots of considerations you also touched on, which then has me thinking, this is starting to sound a little bit complicated and a bit complex. So how do organisers work in partnership with the, the um, investments that they're making, be it in NGOs or charities or some sort of, to, have, to have, know that you're making impact and not be too overbearing, you know? <laughs> That's a fine line to walk sometimes. And we always wonder whether we're, we're you know, stressing them too much or whether we're being as supportive as we say we want to be. Um, that's a good question. I think, first of all, what's really important is that we very aligned with what we're trying to do together, you know, have the same common objective and really want to see this positive change. And, um, and then it's for us, it's to listen very much to what they need from us. Besides the money, the money is one thing. And, um, and I mean, we don't have unlimited resources, so it's, it's also important, but really listen to the needs and, um, as best as we can try to adjust and understand that maybe they need to set up a new monitoring and evaluation system to actually monitor what's going on, collect the data that they need. And for us, it's maybe to provide that type of unrestricted funding and tell them, we give them the, we make this donation, we give you this grant over a number of years, you deal with it. 
Now you report back to us, you call us when there is a problem. We want to understand because we know that what you're doing is not perfect science. It's something that you will need to iterate on and maybe improve as you go along. So it's to be, to accompany them through all this. And when COVID, COVID hit la last year and um, we called our partners and said, so what are your needs right now? Do you need to pay salaries and send everybody home because you need to stop all activity because of the situation? In that case, know that the money we've given you, you can use it as best you need. Yeah. And, and if you want to put it aside to resume your activities later, it's your call. So it's kind of, when I talk about partnership, is really that level of more, it's a collaboration. And I know that, um, Yes, it sounds a little cheesy because, you know, people look at us funders and say, well, you have the money, so of course, you know, you have the power. And, and I don't think it has to be this way. And in the sense that I'm happy to be convinced that what we, our decisions were not the right ones. Or a funder would say, if that's the kind of way you want us to work, we don't want your money. And I would respect that very, very much because they maybe need a lot more freedom that I'm able to give them. I'm reporting to a board as well. So, but it's to find the same kind of understanding of how together we can get to where we want to go. So it's in the spirit of true partnership, where the two of you, I mean, you've both got to learn a little bit, some is a little bit of give and take. It sounds like you've learned a lot on this journey for the number of years you've been, you know, funding and you've been on both sides of the fence as well, in terms of being the other side, receiving the funding now, now giving it out. What can you share with other organizations? What kind of lessons could you share? Uh, I was just saying that I don't give lessons to anybody, but anyway. Well, insights from your, you've, you've had the experience. So what have you learned along the way? Well, what I think, uh, I'll come back to a few maybe points I touched upon. Um, I think uh, data is about learning. It's not about, you know, uh, being a judge of anything. It's learning together what's working, not working. How do we correct course if we need to? And it's about using the evidence that we can then get to in inform our decision. As I said, we need to be rational sometimes and see how we can best support positive change by funding an organization versus another. Um, I think also it's, uh, it's very much about, about trust and, and, and the type of collaboration that I'm talking about is that, I mean, I was, um, I was a grantee before I became a funder. So I know very well the position we're in when the funder calls you and wants, you know, reports or- Tell, and me, that, tell me what's happening here. Exactly. The fact that we can say, well, listen, there was a coup in Mali. Um, operations have stopped for a while until we can resume. We need to make sure that all the staff is safe. And I'm just like, of course. But if you don't tell me anything, and a year later I find out that you haven't reached your targets because you had to stop operations, but you didn't tell me, then I'm just like, well, why don't you call me when this happens? Because that I can understand and I'm be fully supportive. So it's that type of, of collaboration that I really want to, uh, to, to maintain with our, with our grantees and others. Yeah, it's, it's like having a, um, an air of transparency from both sides. So we get, and I, li I love what you said there, that the data is for learning, because I think sometimes we can take the data and you <laughs> use it almost as a stick to say, look, it's not right, this isn't absolutely correct, but it's more just an informational point that we're using to, to get some of that information back. And just to wrap up, can you maybe give us one or two of your big success stories? Oh, that's very unfair. <laughs> well, yeah. Examples, examples of some of the oh, incredible I'll, I'll, work I'll, I'll you've mention done. because we're talking about education, and there's this fantastic organisations working in India called Educate Girls. Um, they've decided to go in the, um, the when they started to go in the, the um, state of India which has the biggest gender gap between boys and girls is that we're going to send those girls to school but then the traditions will prevent girls from attending school so not only have they sent hundreds of thousands of girls into schools but these girls have stayed in schools and they're learning so that's a major success and we continue to fund them and uh, and they're going through uh, a lot right now in India but um, this, this, this is one of the major success and but there's many many others in in many different areas so. it would be over the number of years that you've been doing this thank you so <laughs> much for joining us and sharing uh, sharing with us today uh, Pascal ladies and gentlemen